Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we're going to start a new series of mold fabrication, which is similar to the last parts that we made, which was that large ABS white part. Well this week, or this series, we are going to mold a white ABS disc like this, and a couple of white ABS rings like this. I can't really say what they're used for, but we are going to make three molds in this series. Uh, the two rings are pretty similar, so I'll probably just combine the fabrication of those two molds because it's effectively almost the same part. And then with the white disc, we're going to talk about how we are going to eject from the A side of the mold and use the injection unit itself with a, a sprueless injection. So the injection unit of the, of the molding machine will come right up to effectively the cavity that creates this disc and inject with a, a little bit of a remnant on the back. And we'll talk about how, how we do that, as well as pneumatically activated A-side ejectors, which are basically air cylinders that are machined into the mold block itself. So stay tuned, and we will probably have several episodes on this series, because there's three molds with the fabrication and the running of the parts. So enjoy. So we're going to start off with the two ring molds first, and I think I'll just show both of those together like I mentioned in the intro. So here what we're doing is machining out the center round core that will create the open circle inside of the ring. And only really the side walls that are machining now are exposed to the mold cavity. Most of the top of this disc is going to be a shutoff surface which basically blocks plastic from filling uh, where the two mold halves meet and, and contact. Uh, but there will be a runner that's machined into the center because the, the plastic entry point for this mold is going to be at the exact center of this, of this ring with a hole in it. There'll be three tunnel gates that extend out from the center core or the center port, I should say. And after we machine this circle out, we will send it over to the lathe to do the backside work and cut the profiles, which will actually be the exposed surface to the, to the cavity of the part. Here we go, we got all of our tools set in that little quasi time lapse that we just did. And we are ready to drill and ream all of our back holes and then make our two mounting holes for this core insert. We're looking at the back of the core. And then when we're done with all this, we're gonna load this, we're gonna bandsaw out the corners and then stick this guy on the lathe to do the, um, the profiling of the, of the core itself. And then we'll cut the runners on the other side to connect with the reamed holes that are going to have ejectors for the tunneling gate runner. All right, enough said, let's do it. So I slowed down everything and we will hit cycle start. Yeah, that's a little too slow. First step is to center drill all of our drill. So that we have accurate positioning. I'm going to keep on the feet hold and slow down things just in case I didn't get a tool offset right or something. Alright, that looks good. Maybe I'll get the coolant ready. So we got three ejectors for three gates since there's going to be three features in the part that, that it's best to have the, the tunnel gates pointing at these features because that's the strongest part of the, of the part, these kind of these three bosses, or the area that needs the most strength, I should say. Okay, so now we're going to... 
we're going to drill the clearance hole for our 3 16 screamer. Looks good. I'll probably pause this and try out a ejector pin on this first hole to make sure that this drilled hole is not bigger than the reamer. <laughs> Spindle stop. So let's see. No, see that goes through. That's a problem. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna have to reduce the drill bit size and figure out what's up. All right, well I stopped the program and put a smaller drill bit in there, and I guess I'm just gonna have to use a slightly oversized ejector pin for that first hole, unfortunately. But we need to get back to the position in the program that we started, or that we uh, switched to the drill. So we're going to bypass all the center drilling stuff in this G-code, and then deep drill is the beginning. So we will skip the first deep drill. Which is the G83, and go to the second deep drill. Okay, and then we're going to do a cycle start at this point in the program. There's this little procedure where it shows you how it went to the last position, and now it's going to the new position. I think I'm going to stop this program early. Make sure that our next drill bit size smaller is actually the right size so that this pin will fit in there. And it is. It could be that that other drill bit was dull or ground off center. Uh, it could have been reground. So, but anyway, yeah. So this hole is definitely too big. I dropped the drill bit size by one drill index size and now it's too small. So that drill bit definitely had an issue. So I'll have to just fix that later, I guess. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, we can do that same trick again because I stopped the program again. All right, and then cycle start. Yeah. It's still going to go back to the last kind of position with the last tool, and then it will go back and do its continue with the position in the program that I set it to. That way you don't have to run everything over again or go and edit your program. You can just fast forward on the mill, at least on these Haas mills. I guess I should have started with the pilot hole for the half 13 threaded hole instead of one of the ejector pin holes. Oh well. <laughs> And this is the center ejector, which is going to be in line with the sprue. Uh, and we, it's, it's a good idea to have an ejector pin that's recessed so that you can pull the sprue out reliably. Even though on this mold it's going to be a really short sprue, if there's any sprue at all. Alright, these are the pilot holes for the half 13 threads. Then we're going to chase it out with a larger drill bit after this. Actually, uh, so this is the reaming operation. And, but this hole is oversized now. <laughs> I like to use oil on reamers. I 
I'm increasing the feed rate a little bit, especially on this through hole. <laughs> yeah, that drill bit definitely had issues. I think my reamer is dull. <laughs> Turn the regular coin back on. Come with the half 13 tap. That's half inch, 13 threads per inch. I might just be ready on the reset on this. Things get out of hand. There's a decent amount of force, especially with this older tap. No, oh, it wasn't so bad. And that's rigid tapping. So the Z-axis is synchronized with the RPM of the tap itself. All right, there we go. I need to chase out that one bad hole with a larger reamer and probably get a slightly newer 3 16 of an inch reamer to fix up those other holes. But no, I won't bore you on camera with that. So I went ahead and chased this hole out to a 730 seconds ejector pin and ringed it. So we're good on our three ejector pins now. Or actually our four. One center and one oversized one. So I'm going to flip this assembly over. And I'm thinking about actually machining the uh, cross pattern. But I, I realize I probably need to turn this to, to height in the lathe itself. So I don't think I can do that quite yet because I don't have the final thickness. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to saw this out and we're going to run it on the lathe to form up the other side of our insert. This is the back side. Okay, so I've cut off the corners of our rough billet that we're going to stick in the lathe next, but I figured we can go ahead and machine the three plastic runners on the back, and that'll be a little bit easier since I'm referencing the original flats of the square stock that I machined square to fit in this vise. The stock currently is 25.4 millimeters or one inch, and our final size is going to be 25 millimeters. So I've effectively added an extra 0.4 millimeters to the depth of cut for this three quarter or the this three sixteenths uh, ball end mill. Alright, so I think we are ready to go. Um, let me make sure the program's loaded. Alright the program is loaded so I'm gonna pull the tool off the surface. Actually I'm gonna double check and make sure I set the tool height and I did. So I'll come up on Z I set the center using the center finder, that cone shaped thing. So we're set. Slow everything down, hit the cycle start. And we'll go to the first position for our runner. And this is gonna be part of a tunneling gate as well. 
That's why the ejector is not quite right at the end of the runner because we need some flex to pull the, the tunneling cone of plastic out of the part. I think I'll turn on the coolant though. And then this hole is our center ejector, which will also pull the sprue if there's any out of the A side of the mold. And then we're gonna move over to this ejection port or inject or tunnel injection spot and then machine this tunnel injection spot. There we go. Now we stick around the lathe. All right, we're back over on the lathe and here's our part that we just machined with the back runner. And I'm gonna load this thing into our free doll chuck. Chuck for this application. So we'll have to see how, how good it centers up. So I'm going to manually turn the spindle and see what our runout looks like. Ooh, it's looking pretty good. This is a really good chuck. I wish I remember what it was called. But yeah, that's uh, within one thousandths actually. So that's cool. Maybe I'll turn the spindle on and see. I got spindle balance. That's probably a little too fast. Oh, and we've got the machining, the tool entry mark from the CNC milling operation. But yeah, I can't get it much better than that. <laughs> or a three jaw chuck. Maybe I'll tighten it, see if that makes it any better or worse. Yeah, still within 1,000s. Okay. I guess the other question would be the face. I'm gonna have to face this off using the, the tool and then probably measure with calipers on the three quadrants or, well, three triads <laughs> and uh, check to see that this surface is parallel to the back because we could be good here radially but it could still have a weird geometry where it's cocked uh, on the face relative to the uh, to the back of the part. So, but yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah, and I got a new tripod, which is much nicer than the old one. So yeah, hopefully I'll get better looking results here. And we got the GoPro in the back. Okay. I don't know why it keeps telling me my spindle speed is out of... There we go. Alright, we're going to do 300 RPM. And I'm going to bring the tool in. We're going to get an interrupted cut, which basically is chopping off the out of round part. You gotta be careful with these because you can wind up 
over torquing and knocking your part out. If you take too big of a cut way out at the end when it's interrupted. So I like to take my time on these interrupted cuts. false sense of mass removal. <laughs> And now we're starting to get to a full cut. CNC portion versus the turn portion of this disc is a pretty good run out with this chuck, so I'm happy with that. So actually, let's let's face the uh, front now real quick so we can get a dimension. In fact, while I've got this diameter still referenced, I'm not going to change it, but I'm going to measure it and then sync up my DRO with the actual true measurement with the caliper. Alright, so we're going to enter that on the DRO, X138.07, absolute. Alright, so we've synced up our DRO with our caliper measurement for this diameter, which is within 70 microns or about three thousandths to the number that we told the mill to cut it to. I don't really feel a step here. So the concentration, yeah, actually I feel a little bit of a step there. So we're not going bad, and you can see the, the tool lead in and lead out. And uh, when you see and see cut something like a disc like this, you do get full flexor. So I can see how this side would be slightly bigger than this side, because this was the top of the cut. Um, so maybe I'll run the, uh, the cutter a little farther in and see if I can get it down to exactly 138.00. But first, let's face off the front so we kind of true up this stock better. Uh, let's see here. All right, I think I'm happy with this RPM, even though it's kind of low, but this is a large diameter part. I could set up a very uh, surface speed. 
uh, where the RPM increases as we go to the center, but I don't want to mess around with that. I do see a little bit of a deviation in the surface, but I am cutting the original stock surface of this billet aluminum. So I'm going to be real careful and not overcut because we only have 0.4 millimeters to work with here. GoPro is walking away. And I'm just manually turning this. Of course, I'm in fine mode, so it's taking a little longer. All right, let me back out. I'll switch to course so I can dial this a little faster. I'm going to set the X, I mean the Z, now. Just absolute, so I got a zero to know how much I've taken. And I may have to knock this part in some more on the on the lathe cut. I'm cutting a record. Yeah, I definitely have a, a little crooked. Let's see what we get. Well, it's 25.44. The side I've been cutting. And this is 25.46 over here. So I think maybe the stock was just out. <laughs> All right, I'm going to increase the spindle speed to 500 RPM. I'm going to get this show on the road. So I'm going to take 0.2 off. Since my measurement said that we've got, we're not that far off from one side to the other. Now we're getting into our runner system here. So we've got a three, Three-way interrupted cut. Okay. Reset the Z. And I'll move it out of here so we can get another thickness measurement. Okay, 25.3. Twenty-five point one eight. Twenty-five point two. Twenty-five point three. So this is this is the thin side. So we took more material off this side. 25 25.29 so this has to, this back has to come out or the thinnest dimension I need to bump it in towards the vice. 25 to 4. 
two five three seven. It seems like the surface is out, so let me get a little whack. Then we'll try again. All right, we'll take 0.1 millimeters off. I can also shim the, the base of this mold core and the mold cavity or the receiver itself. And that way I can basically square this thing up as well. But it'd be nice to have a, a trued up mold core that just drops in without having to mess with shims and stuff. This portion of the mold core is not part of the part. It's shut off against another flat area. So the surface finish doesn't have to be awesome in the middle here. But out at the edge, it'd be nice if it was. I, I think it's going to be bead blasted anyway. Might get some interesting color effects. Spinning, uh, refractive grading. <laughs> okay, I think I'm heating up the thing. I think I need to do my finish cut going that way. <laughs> Got a little bit of a wave in the surface. 2509. 2509 once I wiggle it. So this needs to get knocked out by like two thousands. <laughs> I'm reluctant to put a shim back there, but I may have to. Let me think about it for a second. I did is I found the thick part of this disc and with the rubber mallet I just whacked it from the backside just just enough to, to kiss it against uh, to pull it away from the hard stop of this jaw so I guess these jaws aren't within a thousandth of each other so anyway I just did a test cut and uh, we are within like half a thousandth or so based on that caliper measurement so I think I am going to zero the Z again and then move it in 0 0.07 because I like to always add a little bit of a shut off preload even though this is a huge disc. But uh, yeah, I think I'll do 70 microns uh, to take this off and then we'll see where we're at. I can always machine the pocket deeper in the mold base as well. All right, so let's do our finished cut. I'm still gonna manually do this. But I'm on the fine, so it'll take a while. And I'm not gonna back out because I got some weird wave cuts from using the backside of this cutter. 
So we're just going to go forward nice and slow. Of course, I'm building up an edge there. There we go, now we're in the interrupted cut, so that should help break that chip. Again, this area is not part of the part. It's just a shut off surface where the plastic uh, is shoveled out to the tunnel gates that are going to be on the perimeter of this part. This part is basically a big plastic tube with like a square flange overlaid on it. No, a round flange. <laughs> Alright, so I am going to hit Z0 here and then move away and not drag the back of the tool across. Sometimes you can get a decent finish, but in this case, it didn't seem to want to do that. And I've got the zero set on the lathe. So now we've got to cut the profile for our inner round rib for this plastic part, and then the 30 degree seal ridge, like, uh, you know, like the, the, the valve seat in an engine block. And this, the seal part, the 30 degree angle, is going to shut off and close off the cavity so that the plastic won't squirt behind the, the stripper plate. So I've got a very advanced drawing here. <laughs> so our first dimension, basically we're going to start off at the lead diameter. I'm going to tell it to do a 1 degree angle out until we drop into 6.394 for a depth. And then we're going to do a 30 degree angle out until we're at 11.152 for a depth on Z. So I will double check which angle is correct. So I'm going to go on the controller here. I'm going to say do one paper and 45 and we're going to do incremental set. So right now the angle is set for 45. So when I turn this knob down here, our tool is going to cut at a 45 degree angle. So positive 45 is the direction we want to go based on this drawing. And then it'll go back to what our arbitrary position was. So I will get out of the angle set and then go back to DRO and we'll move our tool to 131.825. We go to fine, get some more dimensions or more precision. 131.825. This is uh, millimeters, so that's 825 microns. Then we'll bring our Z to zero. I should probably double check that that angle is one degree, so I'll be right back. Well, as it turns out, that's actually a three degree angle, not a one degree angle. So, I'm glad I checked that. Okay, so we're at 131.825 and we are at zero on Z. So I'm going to tell it to do one and then a taper and then three degrees, three points and then incremental set. So now you can see we now you can see we've got the angle set to three positive, which is going to go out from this location. And yeah, we are set. Okay, so we are gonna go at a three degree angle until we get to Z of 6.394. And I am set on the fine setting, so let's do it. It's gonna be an aggressive cut. I'm 
hope that doesn't wad up on me. I guess I can back out. I may have wanted to do more than a single pass on this, because we're going to have a lot of this, this ribbon. <laughs> Alright, let's try again. And we're still holding with the 3 degree angle. Looks like it's three. Make sure we're going outward. So X is increasing as Z is decreasing. Okay. So we'll get to our 6.394. We were close. I'm going to back off again and stop this. The problem with this this single cut operation is that it takes all of it in one pass. It's like a dumb cut. It's not like it's going to hug out. Let me get some uh, pliers. Yeah, so when you do a single operation or a taper, it's just going to cut a straight line. It doesn't know how much material it's taken off. So if this was like a steel insert, I probably would have done a, a DXF import and then done a, a full conversational CNC program to hog out, stair step away the bulk and then do a finish cut. But since this is aluminum and a relatively light cut, we're just going to have to deal with the ribbons that we're creating. Okay, so we'll turn on the spindle again. And with our angle function, we always go back to the start point and then it stops at the software limit. So we're back at the beginning. 131.825 and Z equals zero. And we got real close to our target dimension of 6.394. So I think we're gonna get that here. There we go. Now I'm gonna turn off the spindle because now we have to change our angle to 30 degrees. So we're going to go to do one and then taper and 30 incremental set. So that's a positive 30 degree. And then that will, we're basically going to take that angle all the way out of the cut. So spindle back on. Before we get too much chatter, I'm going to start moving again. And we're seeing that we've got a 30 degree angle developed. And we're just taking this all the way out. Because as we stop cutting aluminum, we should be at our final dimension of 11.15, which looks like we, we hit it. Okay, now I'm gonna turn off the angle and go back to the regular DRO and then back out of this. And there is our two-step cut there. Maybe not the best way to approach it since we were building up bird's nest with all this aluminum ribbon, but it was also quick and easy. <laughs> and there is a burr at, here at the top, a lead-in burr for cutting, but for mold parts, it's actually good to have a little bit of a micro burr there because this is a shutoff surface. So that's just gonna prevent plastic flash from trying to force its way into this shutoff area. But at the same time, some of this is actually a finished edge Actually, as I recall, this this is fully the part. So I think I probably will break this edge, but not with the tool. I'll, I'll just use a stone. So let me get that. And making sure I'm not going to get into the jaws. And actually, when you're bringing in files or something, you, you don't want the, the tool to shoot through your hand if it catches on the jaw. So you always want to give it a place to launch that's not your body part, in my opinion. There we go. Yeah, because if I'm holding it like this, and then this stone gets up, up into this jaw, and this jaw is going at 2,000 RPM, then this stone is going to basically break my hand. <laughs> As, because it's got no other place to go. Okay. I think we are good. I'm a little leery about this machine finish from the CNC because of tool flexure. But we're kind of grabbing on here, and this is all going to be subterranean in the mold. 
So this is just keying in this, this shape that we're actually going to be uh, exposed to the plastic. So, and we can't really grab onto anything now because these are finished taper surfaces. So uh, yeah, I think basically I'll just compensate for this in the, uh, the machine pocket that this core is going to be set into with these half 13 bolts on the back. So I think that covers it for this one. And we can just pull it off and yeah. and we're expanding to pull the part out instead of the last part where you had to constrict, constrict to pull the part out. Oh, there we go. It's all an old core. You can see the the lead-in for the CNC tool there, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. Okay.